We're back. The final. We're here. Two-part video series here. We're going to go through 1 through 10, and then our second one, we're going to go through 11 through 20. Touching every horse in this run for the roses this coming Saturday at beautiful Churchill Downs. My partner is always Caleb Knight. We have a fun little uh, field here. It's an interesting year. There's a lot of money being bet. There's one individual betting a lot of money on this race, which will definitely move the odds. So interested to see how that pans out. Um, before we get started and going through the horses, I just wanted to share a little bit about my structure and how I looked at this race um, and sort of how I handicap. And I have two rules when I'm handicapping the Kentucky Derby. Number one, start off with the pace projector from time form and work right to left. I start with the horse that's way out on the lead and work all the way backwards and see, can that horse make the distance? Does he have the speed to hold up? And is this the opera, is this the trip that the horse needs based on the profile? And the second thing for me is my 95 rule. I think it's one of the best rules that comes in to play when you look at the Kentucky Derby. Since 1992, 27 out of 30, 90% of Kentucky Derby winners have entered the race with at least a career best buyer speed figure of 95. So basically I'm looking at horses, focusing I should say on horses, over 95. Not saying they can't, somebody else can't win, but I'm really focusing on horses that have a 95 or better. And that's sort of how I break down the Kentucky Derby when I started my handicapping this past Friday. Caleb, any insight on how you look at it? Yeah, Andrew, I think we're pretty similar in our overall approach. I think that for me, just like you mentioned, it starts with the pace. I'm a pretty simple guy and I look at the history of the Derby the past eight or 10 years and you pretty much need to be forwardly placed if you wanna have a chance to win the race. So I'm really going to be targeting on horses that I think are going to be somewhere in that first flight within two or three lengths of the lead going into the second call. Short price deep closers are not for me. I know you're probably in the same position as I am there. So those ones can pretty much beat me. And there's, there's no shortage of derby systems or rules, you know, or other kind of uh, caveats people use when handicapping the Kentucky Derby. I find that John White's Derby strike system is pretty interesting, and that's something I always pay a little bit of attention to. So uh, I kind of give a glance to that. It helps me eliminate horses that are maybe a little more fringe contenders, in my own opinion, but helps me get rid of some of them or upgrade a few others. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, final times have always been a big thing with the Derby as well. People always look at that final time. Um, this year, I think it's going to be a fun race. I think we have a very spread field between the haves and the have-nots. So there should be opportunities to toss some horses here. So I'll start us off on the number one horse here, Modonigal. Uh, took the Got the uh, the rail here, which used to be death in the derby, but not so much anymore now that we go to a day to 20. Irad's fifth derby with his best finish, the four, coming in fourth on Improbable in 2019. Muldonigal ran down early voting in that wood. That wood came back super strong. I speak to a number of independent fig makers, and they put that as the strongest of all the preps when we look at the figs. Um, all three of his wins came in New York tracks, which isn't too much of a bother for me, but they did come out of that aqueduct where you can get some funky numbers coming out of it. Um, he comes to Churchill Downs as a closer and will be leaving from post number one, so he doesn't really have to worry about saving ground and dipping behind. He, he really just needs to break not as fast as the other and let people clear. Um, he will need the up front. He'll need the trip up front definitely to uh, press and he'll have to pass most likely 18, 17, 18 horses in order to win the race. Um, it's going to be a tough one. The Pletcher training has been working good, working with grade three winner prankster who won earlier this year. Uh, I think he, the horse is an amazing horse in many races. Uh, I think it's tough as a lower priced horse in a, uh, 20 horse field closing. It's not going to be the easiest, but I'll have him on a number of my tickets at 10 to one, um, especially coming in under those tries and uh, supers. Why don't you tip us off with the two horse? Sure thing. Yeah. I think the, the post from O'Donagle definitely uh, soured a lot of folks, myself included, but it does help with the price. So I think that's a, an interesting horse there. As far as number two, Happy Jack, perhaps a little bit less interesting. I think that this is a horse that is probably just kind of happy to be here. He, he has his maiden win, and then he's kind of failed to post any sort of a competitive race in his next three starts. He's been pretty well handled by the likes of Messier and Taba and, and Forbidden Kingdom in each of his last three starts, and really would be a big surprise, in my opinion, to see him make any kind of an impact today. He's going to be stuck down on the inside for a horse that doesn't really have any natural speed. The blinkers are coming off, which tells me they're probably planning to go ahead and take this horse back and make one big run. And he's just not fast enough. I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about in all the ways in which he's not fast enough, but he's going to be the longest price on the board. 
I think if he finishes in the top half of the field, it would be a win for these connections. And truthfully, I don't see a way he makes uh, too much of a splash against some of the horses in this race today. So happy Jack, happy to be here, but probably not making uh, much of an impact. What do you think of number three, the uh, second favorite, uh, according to the morning line, uh, Epicenter? So uh, I was about to start off, second co-favorite, favorite, seven to two, three to one. It all really depends in this situation, I think, what Mattress Mac puts his money on, because that's what's going to move the line here. Maybe co-favorite, Joel gets the mount. This is his 11th derby. He won an orb in 2013, so he definitely has the experience there. Epicenter gives Steve Mapp- Asmussen, the most winning trader in thoroughbred history, the real chance here to win the derby. Um, I look at this horse over and over again on the PPs, and all I can say is two words, tactical speed. The horse on paper looks tough to beat and has done nothing wrong in the preps, especially down at fairgrounds. Uh, the speed figs are perfect, and he should step forward a little bit more here. Should be in the second group, just off, maybe three or four back. Um, the post three is a little bit of concern because he's going to have to use a teeny bit of energy going forward. But those one and two being uh, not necessarily the fastest of horses will help him. Um, I'm always just a little concerned on the inside. You know, horses tend to really just gym to the rail, so he can get pushed over a little bit. But he should have enough tactical speed to clear. Um, win contender for sure, but... I'll tell you right now, I'm not betting a favorite on Derby Day. That's not something I'm doing. I'm looking for value here, especially in a 20-horse field like this. Talk us through the uh, the number four here, Summer is Tomorrow, and what do you think he's going to do out of that gate? Yeah, speaking of tactical speed, I think that number four, Summer is Tomorrow, is your likely leader in this race. Uh, maybe Classic Causeway goes out there and gives him a challenge, but Summer is Tomorrow is one of the first pure sprinters that we've seen since – the Derby point systems and put into place. Now, this horse was nothing but a sprinter for the first six starts of his career. Uh, when they stretched him out to seven furlongs, he responded with a really nice win, which gave the connections enough confidence to throw him into the deep end of the pool in the UAE Derby. And he really didn't embarrass himself in that race. He made the lead that day and carved out some pretty honest fractions. I know that uh, Maidan is sometimes known as a track that tends to carry speed horses a little bit further than they may actually want to go. But I think that on World Cup Day this past year, it was a very dull strip. The times were not quick. The raw times were not very fast. I mean, this horse, Summers Tomorrow, carved out similar splits or even a little bit quicker compared to what Life is Good did in the actual Dubai World Cup. So I think that the pace of that race was very honest. And Summers Tomorrow did quite well to hold on for second. He was well beaten by Crown Pride in that race, but I don't think that uh, there's a ton to be embarrassed about by there because there's a lot of people you know, on Twitter and on the backstretch who seem to really be impressed with the way Crown Pride is, Crown Pride is tra- uh, trained since he's come here. So for me, I think Summer is Tomorrow is a, is a long shot and he should be a long shot, but will at the very least play a factor in how the pace sets up and might be able to uh, take him a little farther than most people give him credit for. That being said, he's probably not a horse that I think is a very strong win threat in this race. All right, let's go to number five, Smile Happy. Where'd you land on this horse, Andrew? Well, speaking of Mattress Mac and Run Happy, Smile Happy, uh, Kenny McPeak, Corey Lannery, Lannery gets in the saddle six time at the Derby. He had a great trip. I uh, actually hit him that day and looking at Lee for a second. In a muddy and off condition, which we might see on Saturday. I think we're going to see some uh, some moisture for sure on Friday. Looks like that Saturday rain is going to stop about 2 or 3 p.m. So hopefully the track is drying by then. But uh, Corey definitely knows how to handle Churchill Downs in the slop. Um, <clears throat> Horse got beat last time, out, last time out by a strong closing Zandon in the bluegrass. I think there was more setup there than anything else. Um, everything from the horse's side, taking a PPs, I crossed them out right away. And I'll tell you the reason why. Um, I was watching the morning works the last five, six days. And I kept on looking up the weather and the temperature, and I couldn't figure out what's going on. The horse was so washed. Went back, looked at a couple of replays. Horses seems to be washed and gets worked up. If that horse is getting worked up at a morning workout like that, it doesn't really have the speed anyway, and it's getting worked up like that when there's 2,000 people at the track. When 105,000 people come in on Saturday, I think the horse is just a complete toss. This is one of the horses that I'm just looking at as crossing off my PPs right away. So moving on, we'll continue down the list here. Who did you, what did you think of uh, our Canadian friend over here, Messier? Uh, yes, uh, Messier trained by the uh, the great uh, Bob Yakfurt or uh, you know, Tim uh, Yakteen, I guess, is what we're going to go with this year. So for me, uh, this is a horse that I think really needs to be considered. I think he's probably not getting, I didn't think he would get the respect he deserved 
coming out of that San Anita Derby, given the fact that he was beaten by his stablemate uh, Taba that day. But watching that race, I mean, Messier truly did all the dirty work. I mean, he was up there pressing Forbidden Kingdom, setting a pretty honest pace or pressing a pretty honest pace. He easily put away Forbidden Kingdom, who you know, perhaps had some uh, physical issues, but faded very badly to finish way up the track. And Messier honestly looked every bit of a winner turning for home before getting you know passed by his stablemate inside the eighth pole. I'm not that concerned about the fact he was beaten there. I still thought he ran a strong race. I think he's very tactical. He's very experienced compared to a lot of the other horses in here. You know, he has six starts and he's never missed the exacta. Uh, if you kind of discount those Los Alamitos races, those were two of his three losses. Some horses just don't care for Los Al due to the tight turns and the bull ring configuration. So for me, I'm not going to be too hard on a horse that lost at a bit of a quirky track. That being said, I mean, the Baffert off angle is a big question mark this derby to see how those horses are going to respond. But if the Santa Anita Derby is any indication, these horses are still incredibly talented. So I think Messier is a horse that really needs to be respected and given a, a real hard, long look at a horse that fits the run profile of a horse that is typically a Derby winner, has the right figures, and uh, certainly coming into this race in good form. I think that takes us to arguably the most interesting horse in the entire field, number, crown, number seven, Crown Pride. What do you think of the Japanese Invader? So talk about interesting. You took the words right out of my mouth here. First derby for Christoph. Uh, this is the most interesting trained horse I've seen, period. Been following horse racing for 20 plus years. I've never seen something like this. 72 hours before the derby, and they're doing a five furlong workout on the track. I don't know what's going on here. Um, the horse is tough on data because there's just not much of it. Where he hasn't raced here, we don't have much behind it. Uh, going back to that that those UAE races, I mean, the horse did do well. Um, it showed dominance in, in how it ran. The Japanese have been dominating in Saudi Arabia and Dubai this year. Um, the UAE Derby watched that replay. The speed was just perfect. The, the horse sat off perfect trip and then just, it was push button, turned it off. Again, going off a of lack of data here, um, I did the conversions from time form to time form US. Uh, didn't really come out perfect, but uh, it definitely shows the horse has the figures to be right there. Um, I think this horse is going to be very interesting, and hopefully I'll, I'll get an answer on Saturday and I can stop scratching my head. But uh, I'm going to have this horse on a number of my tickets, especially in my trifectas. I think this is a horse that can come in and blow it up. Um, I do think, though, my, my when I did my feral odds here, I do think this horse comes in a little shorter than it is right now. I think 20 to 1 was a little bit high. I think this is one of those where we have an opportunity to uh, to lose a little bit of value on it. Um, which brings us to the eighth horse, which I find uh, another interesting one. Talk about a horse that showed up late to the scene. Uh, what do you think about Charge It here? Yeah, Charge It definitely feels to me like, uh, potentially between him and Crown Pride, honestly. One of these two kind of feels like the wise guy horse in this race. I think that everybody who watched the Florida Derby saw how green Charge It was in that race. He had some trouble out of the starting gate. He banged into the side of the gate, and he was a little bit wide. He made a nice move to get into contention, and then he was lugging out and then lugging in. He was shying away from the whip. He was a very, very green and experienced racehorse, but he flashed potential in there. And I think that potential is going to get a lot of people interested in charge it, especially at a price somewhere around, you know, 15 to one, give or take. For me personally, I think that I saw too much greenness to want to go back and bet him in a spot like the Kentucky Derby. I'm really impressed with this horse, and I think he's an incredibly talented colt. I'm really excited to see what I think he might do over the summer. I could easily see him being a Haskell threat, perhaps a Travers threat. I mean, he looks like he wants to run all day. He's a big, beautiful moving colt. But I just think it's a little too much to ask for a horse that didn't race it to. I mean, it's still obviously so green to go from that race in the Florida Derby into the Kentucky Derby where he's going to have 100,000 people in the stands and he's going to be dealing with bumper cars out of the gate and traffic and kickback and everything else. To me, it's just a little too much, a little too soon for him, but he's certainly a horse that I'd be very interested in come this summer. But for right now, he's going to be a pass for me. That takes us to number nine, the other Kennedy Peak horse, Tiz the Bomb. He's done most of his work on synthetics so far. You think he can take to the dirt, Andrew? I mean, I, I, not just synthetic. We'll call this the, tri, the the triathlon horse. That's what that's what <laughs> I've been calling it all week. 
Kenny McPeak uh, brings a horse into the Derby here with over a million dollars in winnings, and most of it's come from turf races. You don't really see that too often. Um, Brian Hernandez gets, gets the mount here. Uh, third der- his third Derby, his best finish was eighth in 2017 on McCracken. Um, to dirt or not to dirt is the question. Um, the horse will win over multiple surfaces. It's won only once over dirt, made in special weight at Ellis Park, and that field that it went against didn't really do much. Um, horses won in all three surfaces. Second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. Uh, he is the richest horse in this field of 20, so you can't really discount him too much for that. The question is, his wins on the Derby Trail came in the Jeff Ruby on synthetic. How does he take to the dirt? I think he does pretty well. Um, has been out working with Smile ha- has been out working Smile Happy in the morning over and over again. Um, but the one thing that I question is, he does fall under that buyer 95 rule. So this is a horse that I don't necessarily want to cross off right away, but he really does fall under there. He is in great form. He's coming in good. Um, he's going to need a dream trip to win, but I'm definitely going to be using this horse in my third and fourth uh, places in my supers for the for Derby Day. But definitely a horse I'm interested to see where he goes from here uh, and, and what he can do this summer. Similar to the, what you just said before, I thought that was a Haskell horse. I think this horse could do some damage this coming summer uh, on, on, the, on the turf. Which brings us to our last horse, the 10. What'd you think? Yeah, we'll wrap up with the morning line favorite, Zandon. I have to admit, I was mildly surprised to see him put in as the favorite. Uh, I kind of thought Epicenter might get those honors. But Zandon is certainly no worse than second choice. So I have no real qualms with the fact that he was put in as the slight favorite in here. His bluegrass was really good. I mean, this is a horse that has gotten better each and every start. That bluegrass, he you know was chasing down a pretty nice horse and smile happy. I mean, he was you know the two year old champion and uh, or one of the better two year olds anyway, if not the two year old champion. And then uh, came in and Zandon ran right by smile happy like he wasn't even moving in that race. You know, I think this horse has a ton of talent and a ton of potential. His risen star was actually quite a bit better than it appears. If you watch that race back, he completely blew the break. He hopped up at the start, came out dead last, and had to try to catch him uncontested lead with epicenter up front i mean he was never likely to be successful in that spot off that layoff and with that start so i think zandon's an extremely talented horse my biggest concern with him is really just his run style uh historically in, in recent years closers have not done well in the kentucky derby and that's putting it pretty mildly uh this is a horse that in his last two starts had a combined uh three horses beat at the first call I just struggle to see that he's going to be really able to work out a trip if he has to pass 18 horses to win the Kentucky Derby at a very short price of, you know, five to two, seven to two, something in that ballpark. He's a horse that while I do incredibly respect, he won't be on top of any of my tickets. I just don't want to take a horse that needs to work out a trip as badly as he's going to need to on top of any of my tickets at a short price. But that, you know, but that being said, I think he's a great Colt, and I, I think he is uh, going to make some noise throughout the summer. Well, that's the first half of our road, uh, our final Kentucky Derby um, video here. What are your two horses that you have to say, if you had to say right now, you're tossing out? Out of those first 10, who are you just saying no shot at all? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a few ways you could probably go here, but uh, I think Happy Jack is kind of an obvious toss, so I I don't really need to spend too much time on that. The one horse that I probably will add that I know a lot of people are building around who I'm just not that impressed with is actually the number seven Crown Pride. I've seen a ton of love for this horse on Twitter, and I'll probably get some hate in YouTube comments for this, but I'm just not that impressed. I watched his replays. And to me, it's a little unclear what he's actually beating over there in Japan. I mean, Combustion is a decent horse. He was beaten by Combustion once and came back to beat him once. And, you know, he, he beat Summer is tomorrow by two lengths, who's probably going to be 70 to one in this field. The UAE Derby was not very strong. I mean, Pinehurst was the best U.S. horse we could muster up, and he didn't show up at all. So for me, I don't really like Crown Pride. I mean, he, he seems like he's not a very good gate horse. He's blown the break in two or three of his four starts. He's a little bit headstrong, a little bit of a hard horse to ride. So for me, I, I, this is not a horse I'm going to have anywhere, Not on, definitely not on top. And he's a horse I think a lot of people are going to build super effectives around that I think is going to be overbet. So for to me, that's the horse I'm not going to have anywhere. Well, for me, I'm going to be using that horse in some. So I hope you're wrong on that one. <laughs> my, my tosses here are pretty 
I like when we don't agree. My tosses here are pretty much in line. Happy Jack, I, I just crossed off pretty quickly here. Um, and, and, you know, the other one that, that really got me was uh, I spoke about it a little bit earlier and, and talk about what, what happens in the morning and, and how a horse reacts. Um, you know, smile happy for me, crossing it off the ticket. Um, I think this horse is just going to be so worked up. And between the paddock coming through all the fans, I think this horse is just going to be too much uh, – too much for him at this time in the career. So those are the two I'm going to toss. Those are our four horses that we're looking to toss or three horses, I should say, that we're looking to toss for this derby to build our tickets around. We'll be back for a second video where we're going to go through the rest of the field and talk about some picks with the Oaks Derby double. Uh, I'll be giving a trifecta and a couple win bets. And I know Caleb's got enough, a couple as well.